everyone, welcome to this talk with v &A Dundee. My name is Nicole Keane and I'm the Creative Programmer here. This talk uh, is part of a wider programme associated with our current designer and residence, Assemble. Assemble are working with the museum, Dundee Central Library and a group of local young people on Making Room, a project which explores the relationship between contemporary production techniques and traditional building crafts. Today we are joined by Rosin Ingleby, a senior curator from the William Morris Gallery in Walthamstow, East London. Rosin is going to be exploring how craft knowledge and artisanal skill were at the heart of William Morris's vision of a rebirth of art and design. Before, um, after that presentation, we're going to move to a audience Q&A. Before I welcome our speaker on, I wanted to draw your attention to how to use that function. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation, and we're going to address those all at the end, as I said. The details of how to use it should have been posted in the chat already, but you can find it at the bottom of your screen. You can just click on it and then you can add your questions in there. So without further ado, I'm going to welcome our speaker, Rosin, on. Hi, Rosin. Hello, hi, nice to see you. Nice to see you. Um, I'm just going to pop my video and audio off and let you lead your presentation and I'll jump back on to field the Q&A with you. Okay, great. Thank you very yeah. much. Bye. Hi everybody, um, as, uh, as I've just been introduced, my name is Roisin Inglesby and I'm the Senior Curator at the William Morris Gallery in Walthamstow. Um, I'm very sorry not to be able to visit you in Dundee today, I was really looking forward to being able to make that trip. Um, but, uh, oh, someone said no sound, is that, that's not, I don't think, hope that's just not me. Um, but uh, I'm, yeah, I'm really looking forward to being able to talk to you about William Morris and his craft principles today. Um, and also how that uh, uh, is to do with contemporary craft and to do with, um, yeah, the, the way that uh, we think about craft in the 21st century, which obviously is very different, um, but also quite similar from Morris's own understanding of it. So I'm going to share my screen uh, with you now. Um, and let me just find the presentation for you. So you don't have to look at me the entire time. Um, so hopefully you can see the slides. Um, let me know if there's any issues with the slides, um, but hopefully you'll be able to see those now. So um, the context of this talk is obviously very different uh, than it was when I first started thinking about the lecture. I think I was invited about a year ago to do the lecture. So it's a very different context than what I was expecting. Um, but actually craft is uh, something that is, I've been thinking about a lot during this period of lockdown. Um, and um, it's something that we, I think something that we have been as a society more drawn to perhaps over the last few months. Um, so the, the, I'm just going to double check with the, um, that Nicole or Emma, can you just uh, put your video on just so that yeah. I can see that everything's all right. Is everything, is everything all right? I just, yeah, I think that's fine. The sound's coming through, um, to me, to Troy and a few other people have said that they can hear everything. So that's okay. okay that's fine. It's just, I'm just concerned. I'm getting some messages saying that people can't hear and obviously that would be, that would be sad. So, okay. As long as you can hear, that's great. Thank you. No worries. Okay, great. Um, brilliant. Okay, so craft is something that we've been thinking about quite a lot, I think, as a society during the lockdown period. Obviously, for people on the front line, workers, people with caring responsibilities, you know, it's been a period where they haven't had any time to do anything, I imagine. But for those of us who um, have had more periods of enforced, I don't know, inactivity and solitude, um, and I think actually it's led to a resurgence in craft skills amongst a lot of people, especially during the beginning period of lockdown in March last year this year um, it was uh, lots of people we know doing baking and making their own bread and sewing their own face masks and doing lots of craft things that actually perhaps they wouldn't have had the opportunity to do under normal circumstances sometimes very ambitious DIY artistic projects so some of this has come from necessity as normal products weren't um, available normal services weren't available you couldn't have people coming in to do things but I think actually the majority has actually come from an understanding of craft as a place of solace, an outlet for create, an outlet for creativity, and also actually a socio-political statement. So this is a world in which a lot of us feel very impotent and um, upset about the fact that we can't actually do anything to, to make it better at the moment. Um, but craft enables you to do something in your own home. Um, you know, when all around you nothing can be done, craft is a way of 
getting matters into your own hands and, and changing something, doing something physical where you can see the change. So I think that for, is one of the reasons why it's become more popular perhaps over the last few months. Uh, so this understanding of craft would have been very familiar to William Morris. Uh, I'm sure most of you know William Morris. He was a designer, poet and political activist who is today pro probably best known for being the creator of wallpaper and textile prints inspired by nature. Um, actually, during his lifetime, he was primarily uh, uh, credited as a poet uh, and an author. Uh, Morris was born in 1834. He died in 1896. So he was a you know, proper Victorian. His life um, was encapsulated by the reign of Queen Victoria. Uh, but he actually considered himself first and foremost a craftsman, you know, not an author, not a writer, but a craftsperson. He worked across a variety of different media that included weaving, block printing, embroidery, typography, stained glass and furniture design. Um, and uh, he was also fascinated by all sorts of craft processes, um, both international and also um, contemporary. So um, we have an image here of William Morris in a smock, um, not your kind of typical Victorian gentleman uh, at all. You know, if you imagine that he should have been wearing um, a, you know, a top hat and waistcoat and black suit, uh, but he's here wearing his artist smock, looking kind of traditionally a bit stereotypically grumpy. Uh, and on the right, we have a later version of Morris, um, this is a posthumous um, depiction of him. Uh, as a, It's a very kind of crafted object. That's why I chose this particular illustration. Um, it's, a, it's a very crafted object. Uh, it's a print, it's a block print, um, but it shows Morris kind of crafted out of lines. Um, there's also, a, a, I would say, more than a passing resemblance to Karl Marx, which again, given Morris's um, political leanings and influence is, I would imagine, not, uh, not coincidental. Um, so the, the next slide uh, shows um, more of what I'm going to be talking about, so Morris's work him, itself. So central to Morris's design process was the conviction that it was not possible to create a beautiful or authentic object without knowledge of the craft skills necessary to make it. He was hugely critical of the division of labour between designer and manufacturer that had increasingly occurred since the Industrial Revolution and took inspiration from the med medieval craft guilds of European history, in which the individuals created objects themselves using the craft knowledge they had acquired through years of apprenticeship and training. Morris was a polymath and worked in approximately five year cycles, typically becoming expert in one medium before moving on to his next project. Rotund, mop-haired, passionate and endlessly determined, Morris was an easily caricaturable figure, and his various craft-related pursuits were a much-loved subject of affectionate mockery by his friend and collaborator, the artist Edward Byrne Jones. The image on the left shows Morris giving a weaving demonstration. On the right is one example of a woven fabric he created in the 1870s. Um, I should just say that Almost everything I'm showing belongs to the William Morris Gallery, so I haven't put image credits in because everything pretty much belongs to us. Um, and if there's anything that doesn't belong to the gallery, then I'll mention that as we go along. Um, and on the right, you see you know, the, the amazingly tactile quality of a woven fabric. Um, and you, you can see Morris's characteristic um, repeat patterns of you know, abstracted use of a flat natural pattern uh, and the kind of the interlocking way in which he, uh, he organized his patterns, uh, which are extremely complicated, um, but also you know, very attractive. And they kind of, they draw you in, I think the, um, the way that the, um, the patterns sort of interlock and interlink uh, are quite seductive to the eye. So as a rule, Morris didn't personally create his products. In 1861, he set up the first iteration of Morris & Co, a hugely successful interior design company, and his business operations were far too large for him to execute his designs himself. But his knowledge of the craft skills necessary for production meant that his designs were entirely in sympathy with the limitations and possibilities of each medium. This means that his designs cannot be transferred from one medium to another. Wallpaper and textiles, for example, are entirely different techniques to make. So you can't just transfer a wallpaper design to a textile. It just doesn't work for Morris. Uh, although these days people sometimes do do that and vice versa. In addition to woven and printed textiles, Morris was skilled at embroidery. 
here there's another caricature of Morris embroidering uh, and on the right a embroidery uh, which was designed by William and then worked by his wife Jane uh, and his daughters May and Jenny Morris. Um, embroidery Here's a picture of, uh, of Jane, uh, his wife, uh, who was a, you know, a famous pre-Raphaelite beauty, uh, and uh, their elder daughter, whose name was Jenny. Um, Jenny um, was a skilled embroiderer, and she was also um, a writer. She was a very interesting woman, um, but she very sadly developed epilepsy as a teenager. And so her life opportunities were really cut short by that because there was no sort of effective understanding or treatment of epilepsy uh, at that time. Um, William and Jane also had another daughter whose name was May, uh, who went on to become you know, an expert embroiderer, and I'll speak a little bit more about her later. So the image that I showed you here here, um, this embroidery, which is enormous, it's about three meters high uh, and two meters wide, it's absolutely huge, uh, was, was worked by, by William and his family. Um, so this traditional sort of feminine skill um, was certainly not beneath Morris and he was very interested in embroidery uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later, uh, but he was absolutely capable and did design huge amounts of embroidery. Morris also embraced the experimental aspect of crafting. His cotton textiles were printed using wooden blocks and dissatisfied with the poor quality, not to mention the negative environmental impact of com commercial synthetic dyes. He worked with a textile manufacturer called Thomas Wardle in the town of Leek, Staffordshire to revive the traditional but almost extinct craft of dyeing with indigo. Morris worked in his own words as a dyer's mate and he wrote to his wife, Janie, Please, I shall want a bath when I come home. You may imagine I shall not be very presentable as to colour. This was as a result of Morris being essentially dyed blue after his, his experiments with the pigment, the dark blue dye that we use for denim jeans. On the slide here, you can see uh, three examples of designs with uh, indigo. So Morris used what is known as the indigo discharge method, which is essentially where you design, uh, where you dye the entire fabric blue. And so the image on the right, you can see the selvage on the side. Um, so, so that shows the initial state of the fabric. You then bleach out uh, the bits that you want to have color, and then you reprint in the colors um, the bits that were then bleached, if that makes sense. So it's a very laborious and complicated process, um, but it's the way of having this very rich blue background that you see on the right, uh, plus the other colors and the intricate design. Um, so it, you know, it's, it's a, it was an experimental technique. Indigo dyeing had all but sort of disappeared really um, as, a, as a craft skill and Morris was uh, instrumental in, in bringing that back. A third caricature by Burne Jones shows Morris cutting woodblocks for illustrations to the Earthly Paradise. The Earthly Paradise was a volume of poems by Morris that retold stories from North, Norse and classical mythology, such as the myth of Cupid and Psyche, which you can see on the right. Burne Jones and Morris collaborated on a proposed set of 500 illustrations, spending Sunday mornings together working out ideas. The blocks were designed by Burne Jones, drawn on the block by their friend and associate Kate Faulkner, and then cut by Morris, which you can see on the left. Although the project ran into technical diff difficulties and the original version of the book did not actually contain images initially. So the point of all this is to show you that Morris practiced what he preached in terms of the indispensable nature of craft knowledge. He got his hands dirty, quite literally, and he took delight in mastering new techniques and manual skills. Morris's relationship with craft is complex and it also changed over the course of his 30 year career. For the purposes of today, uh, because it's far too great a subject just to talk about really, you could write a PhD on Morris and craft. So for the next sort of half hour or so, I'm going to just break it down into three aspects that I think might be helpful. So the first is craft as revolution. The second is craft as experience. And the third is craft as art. So firstly, craft is revolution. So from the outset, Morris's understanding of craft was inseparable from his socio-political outlook. Although he was born into a comfortable middle-class family, uh, his father, who died when he was a teenager, um, worked in the, sort of the city of London in stocks and shares. Um, they had you know, financial interests in you know, a variety of different things. And I will show you an image of the gallery later, uh, which is where Morris lived as a teenager. So you'll see that it was, it was you know, a substantial house. 
Um, despite all this, from an early age, Morris felt acutely the vast income inequality of Victorian Britain. What's more, he explicitly linked the social and political injustice to what he perceived as the aesthetic failings of the world around him. As is the case today, the influx of cheap and poorly made products created with the sole purpose of making profit had undercut not only the quality of material goods, but also the quality of life for the poorly paid workers who produced them. An additional element that we consider and that Morris was conscious of and warned against, but was far less understood than it is today, is the devastating environmental impacts of a world in which cheap production trumps craft values. Morris blamed what he saw as the parlous state of contemporary design on the pursuit of profit and was convinced that beautiful and worthwhile objects could only produce, be produced by workers who were fairly paid and fulfilled in their work. He saw the disconnect between objects and the people who created and consumed them as a major source of socio-political disenfranchisement and argued that full participation in the creative process was the only way in which men and women could exist in harmony with the created world. In 1884, at the age of 49, Morris crossed what is known as the River of Fire and became a revolutionary socialist who followed Marx's interpretation of the socio-political system. He toured the UK, including visiting Dundee on several occasions, lecturing, uh, he spoke at working men's clubs, he lectured outside, um, he did a huge amount of work, sometimes as many lectures as 100 a year. And Morris actually hated public speaking, so this was a real, um, it's a real effort for him. On the screen here, you can see Edward Byrne Jones's original drawing for the etched frontispiece to an 1888 edition of Morris's A Dream of John Ball. Morris's work had previously been published in serial form in the Commonweal, the socialist newspaper that he had set up under the auspices of the Socialist League, which he had founded in 1885. A Dream of John Ball is a novel about the great peasant revolt of 1381. It features the rebel priest John Ball, who is accused of being a lollard, and he is famed for the question, which you can see written here, when Adam, Adam delved and Eve span, who was then the gentleman? Uh, and so you can see on the left is the frontispiece and on the right are the same image and text, although it's very hard to read, have been translated into a socialist banner. Um, so this was a very popular image that was reproduced in lots of different forms. Morris's socialism was intimately linked to a reborn social order in which craft played a central role. He was not advocating a return to the past as such, believe, but believed that aspects of the past should be used as a socioeconomic model. As he stated in a lecture from 1888 entitled The Revival of Handicraft, it may be worth considering how far this is a mere reactionary sentiment incapable of realization and how far it may foreshadow a real coming change in our habits of life, as irresistible as the former change, which has produced the system of machine production, the system against which the revolt is now attempted. It is impossible to exclude socio-political questions from the consideration of, or of aesthetics, or to begin with the general public is grossly ignorant of all the methods and processes of manufacture. This is, of course, one result of the machine system we are considering. Almost all goods are made apart from the life of those who use them. We are not responsible for them. Our will has had no part in their production. For most people, therefore, there is a prohibitive price put upon the acquirement or the knowledge of methods and processes. We do not know how a piece of goods is made, what the difficulties are that beset its manufacture, what it ought to look like, feel like, smell like, or what it ought to cost. So perhaps the clearest vision of Morris's craft-based utopia is that which he laid out in News From Nowhere, which was his utopian novel first published in serial in the Commonweal in 1890. So you can see on the screen on the right here, a Kelmscott Press edition uh, from 1893. In the novel, the narrator, whose name is William Guest, and this is loosely based on Morris himself, uh, falls asleep after returning from a meeting of the Socialist League. He awakes to find himself in a future society based on con common ownership and democratic controls of the means of production. Uh, a society where there's no private property, no big cities, no authority, no monetary system, no divorce, uh, 
women and men can both enter and leave relationships at will, which is probably one of the most radical things about the book, um, in my opinion. There are no courts, no prisons, and no class system, and the Houses of Parliament has been um, transformed into a dung heap, which I think is symptomatic of William's understanding of you know, the, the activities that went on there. Um, it's an agrarian system and it functions because people love their labour, you know, they are interested in the work they do and the craft they do um, and it, the work is fulfilling and enjoyable and crucially craft skills are cultivated and valued. The subject of the portrait that you see on the left, uh, her, her name is Philippa Garrett Fawcett, and she was the daughter of the pioneer suffragist Millicent Fawcett. Uh, Philip was, Philippa was a remarkable woman. Um, you see her knitting here, so a very traditional female craft skill, but actually she achieved um, extremely high marks in mathematics at Cambridge, um, which was before women were actually allowed to um, enter into the university to take degrees, you know, but she was able to do some studies there and she was extremely good at it. And it was said that Fawcett implied, uh, sorry, inspired William Morris to use her name for one of the characters in Use From Nowhere. Mistress Philippa is a skillful stone carver whom William Guest meets during his journey um, throughout the book. And also I should just point out that, you know, as a book, News From Nowhere is in itself a crafted object. So book, the book arts was probably the last uh, craft that Morris really implied, applied himself to. Uh, but the idea of a book, not just as a receptacle for words, but in itself as a crafted, beautiful, made, tactile thing, was something that Morris was extremely passionate about. So I don't know if any of you have read News From Nowhere. Um, I think that Morris's literature has not transcended time in the way that his designs have done and his books are, are not so popular. Um, I would be the first to admit that they are perhaps a little uh, slow for our taste in literature perhaps, um, but audiobook is a really good way to enjoy them, I think. Um, but News From Nowhere is set in 2012. So it's a little bit poignant actually because you know, I was, I was uh, reading it and I was thinking about all the things that Morris sort of hoped and dreamed would have been better by 2012. And of course, some are better, um, but a lot of them are considerably worse. Um, but also the book is perhaps hasn't stood the test of time because there's a fundal disconnect with the way that uh, our society works and Morris's vision for the future. And it does demonstrate the fact that, you know, he was out of step with some of the movements of the 20th century um, in terms of, you know, mass production and sort of the democratization of design, which took, you know, both things that he... Uh, So, hello again. I hope this is now working. Apparently the whole system crashed, um, which is, as one of the commenters said, uh, what happens when you criticise Morris for being out of time. So I'm terribly, terribly sorry about that, except full responsibility for the technological chaos. Um, so to go back to News From Nowhere, I was just saying what a difficult read, what a difficult read it is. Um, but so equally, um, Morris, although he had this kind of what we may consider a sort of, you know, romanticized idealized vision of the uh, of the past uh, and therefore that necessarily doesn't necessarily translate into the future as we understand it uh, he was not against the use of machine production uh, as it as it was so um, I'm showing you now a design for Dove and Rose woven textile um, this was designed to be made with a jacquard loom. So that was a steam powered loom, which was the most technical, technologically advanced option available at the time. Uh, and so for reference, for example, at the Bauhaus, which was, you know, as we associate a school of, you know, modern design and production in the 20th century, they didn't use jacquard looms for the first eight years of their, of their existence. So not until the 1920s. Uh, that they, 1926, I think they started using jacquard looms. So Morris was quite happy doing this in 1879. So he wasn't against technology as such. Um, as he put it, is the change from handicraft to machinery good or bad? And the answer to that question to my mind is, statically it is bad, dynamically it is good. As a condition of life, production by machinery is altogether an evil. As an instrument for forcing on us better conditions of life, it has been, and for some time yet will be, indispensable. So machinery is okay as an instrument for realizing craft skills, it's just that it shouldn't replace them, that's, that's the general idea. 
Uh, and you can see here that this design um, is on a uh, gridded paper. So it's a kind of uh, squared up point paper. Um, and the reason it's on this grid is because the jacquard works on a kind of zero and ones um, system uh, by which uh, the machine needs to kind of to read uh, the system of, of zeros and ones. Uh, and in order to do that, you have to have um, cards that fit in. And that is where this gridded paper comes in to facilitate uh, designs that the machine can read. So I have alluded, though, to the fact that there are problems with Morris's understanding of craft um, in this political sense. And that, I think, is to do with um, labour and craft and you know, work and craft. What is the relationship between the two? You know, is Morris's vision of craft idealised um, because he wasn't you know, a manual labourer? You know, were the people baking bread in North London, who, which I am completely guilty during lockdown, you know, that was because I had time on my hands and the ability to get the products that I needed to do that. It wasn't because I couldn't get a loaf of white bread if I wanted to. So there is this idea of actual craft being a luxury um, and you know, not a necessity. And, you know, is it an idealized vision of labor for people who uh, don't have to work with their hands all the time? So I wanted to show you this um, this object, which is a it's quite a large tile panel. So each um, each figure is made up of two different tiles. So you can imagine the scale of it. Uh, it's an early example of the idealized vision of medieval life that Morris and other artists who contributed to the output of Morris and Co created. So the tiles were all painted by Lucy Faulkner. And they were designed by members of Morris, uh, members of Morris's circle. So Morris, Ford Maddox Brown, uh, Philip Webb. Some of the artists um, are known. Some of them we don't know who did what. Um, but it was definitely a collaborate, collaborative effort. The figures in each tile symbolise a month of the year and depict a relevant seasonal activity. The labours of the month, which is what this is called, was an artistic theme that featured in medieval and early Renaissance art, and the rural activities were sometimes paired with signs of the zodiac, as they are here. So this idea of craft is seen as part of a rosy vision of labour, um, which in many cases, of course, would have been, you know, financially very precarious and, you know, physically backbreaking. And I really don't think it's fair to say that Morris was a hypocrite in his understanding of the importance of work because he worked extremely hard. He got his hands dirty his entire life. He was really, really dedicated to the idea that, um, you know, working was an essential aspect of, of humanity. But there's also the escape, inescapable fact that for him, physical labour, manual labour was a choice. You know, he was a gentleman, essentially, and his craft knowledge was a luxury. It was a luxury that he felt very, very strongly that everyone should have access to, but it was a privilege nonetheless. So, you know, I'm, I'm certainly not blind to the, the difficulties, and he would not have been blind to the difficulties of some of the things that he was saying either. I guess the, the reconciliation in his mind is that you need an entirely new social system um, in order to facilitate uh, a world in which people can enjoy craft and they don't have to labour uh, just to make ends meet. However, the idea of labour being and craft being, um, you know, an essential theme um, and, you know, a social art and artistic um, theme is something that persisted throughout the arts and crafts movement. Um, and this is the last slide in the section, uh, but this is from a later arts and crafts artist called Mabel Estlin. And she studied uh, stained glass design um, under the tutelage of Christopher Wall, who was the leading practitioner at the turn of the century. She was a member of the Women's Guild of Art and a supporter of the women's suffrage movement, uh, and she attended Wall's classes. Um, she set up her own studio in Hampstead, um, and this was probably fired uh, when she was a student. So you know, it's a really uh, nice piece of work, I think. It shows the characteristic um, aspects of arts and crafts um, stained glass design, which is these sort of jewel-like glowing colours separated by very thick black black lines um, and so it's typical of the arts and crafts idiom but also of the arts and crafts understanding of work being an essential aspect um, of life. So to move on to the second section, which is craft as experience. Um, so I'm thinking about this as craft as a way of transmitting tradition and also creating a world. So it's experience in a kind of a, a pretty wide context. Um, you see here a, a Mint and China Works tile a little bit later than Morris uh, by someone called John Morris Smith. Uh, and it's one of 12 which show kind of traditional craft skills. So this one obviously is the potter. 
Um, so Morris's understanding of craft in the sort of craft of experience idea is the use of craft as a way of transmitting tradition and knowledge from one generation to another and one epoch to another. It's a way of absorbing history and reformulating it for the future. It is also the role that craft plays in personal experience, its role in building a person through the skills acquired and in producing a world the maker wishes to inhabit. The earliest demonstration of Morris's belief in the importance of craft is at Red House, which is the home designed for him by his friend and colleague, Philip Webb. Uh, it was the first marital home of Morris and his wife, Jane, and it's where his two daughters were born. Some of you may have been, it's owned by the National Trust uh, and it's in Bexley Heath, which is just south of London. So you see here uh, a cartoon for quarries of stained glass by Morris on the left, and then this stained glass in situ um, at Red House on the right. So Morris, um, especially when he was um, first starting out um, and was first kind of working out like who he was going to be and the kind of life that he wanted to live, made a huge number of objects um, himself. And they used these objects to decorate their home. You know, it was, it was initially, you know, initially this idea of creating the world that he wanted to live in uh, on a personal level. So on the left, you see uh, an embroidery, um, which was designed by Morris, a hanging, it's an embroidered hanging. It was designed by Morris, uh, most likely hung in Red House. It was probably stitched by about three or four people. We don't know exactly, but you can see that there are different hands at work here. Um, and in, that was probably Morris, his wife, Jane, and maybe Jane's sister, Elizabeth, amongst others. And in the early days of their marriage, Morris and Jane uh, worked a lot on embroidery together. Um, they used to unpick examples of medieval embroidery to work out how they'd been stitched, how they were done. Um, and you know, Morris then absorbed this craft skill um, and translated it into new pieces. So you can see here, you know, there's a very medieval atmosphere to this piece uh, and his ability to take on medieval ideas, techniques, and then sort of transform them into something new. It's never pastiche with Morris, it's always just inspiration, uh, I think is, is quite clear here. There's also this tub chair, um, both of these we have in the gallery, by the way, um, the tub chair. Uh, and again, this is an example of Morris, you know, as a young man, still kind of finding his way uh, in craft and in design and making something quite rudimentary. But it's a kind of a mission statement, I feel like a lot of designers make a chair as one of their first pieces. And as a mission statement to you know, proclaim the kind of aesthetic he was interested in. You know, this is, it's, a, it's bold, it is simple. It can be made by a joiner, not a specialist cabinet maker. Uh, it has natural form, it has color. You know, these are all things that Morris then, you know, uh, translated into his later designs. So craft skills and understanding how people had made things in the past was integral to Morris's connection with history and his own creative process. Craft can be seen as a way of experiencing the world and of forming connections with others. As Morris writes in News From Nowhere, for all I know, you may have been wandering into the realms of geography and craftsmanship. So not geography and history, geography and craftsmanship. So craftsmanship, I think for Morris, is a place that we can inhabit and share with others. As Morris puts it, it is the apprenticeship of the ages, in short, whereby an artist is born into the workshop of the world. Um, Morris is one of Morris's closest connections with this idea of, you know, historical craft um, was his home at Camscott Manor. So Camscott Manor also is open to the public um, under normal circumstances. Um, and this was Morris's kind of dream home, essentially. It's in, Cots in the Cotswolds, not so far from Oxford. And these are views taken by uh, Frederick Henry Evans, who Morris invited there uh, in the year of his death in 1896. Um, Morris um, was fascinated by the history of Kelmscott. It was an Elizabethan manor originally. And so the unspoiled craftsmanship and the organic feel um, that was sort of inhabited in the building, I suppose, the idea that you know, the walls could quite literally talk with the craft skills of the ages was something that Morris was deeply um, interested in. And he absolutely loved Kelmscott. But his sympathy for old buildings generally as places of living craftsmanship um, was best manifested in the Society for Protection of Ancient Buildings, the SPAB, which he set up in 1877 with Philip Webb. The SPAB is still going. Um, Morris was very ahead of his time in understanding the importance of historic buildings. Um, in those days, there was almost no legal protection against um, people you know, messing about with or demolishing old buildings. If you owned it, you could basically do what you wanted with it. 
uh, and the idea that buildings were kind of living vehicles of memory and also that they should belong to everybody uh, was something that Morris was, was very passionate about. And it was this movement that was really kind of at the forefront of the building um, conservation movement and you know, places like the National Trust and English Heritage owe a lot to Morris's understanding of the significance of protecting ancient buildings. So as he said, we are only trustees for those that come after that, us. So for Morris, craft is not just an activity, it's a way of life. As the academic Richard Sennett puts it, it is not just a means and end relationship, but it is how that relationship feels and the value of experience understood as a craft is that it turns the craftsperson outwards, engaging him or her with the world around them that simply buying an object cannot. In an analogy very prescient of the inventions of Silicon Valley in the 21st century, Morris argued that making without craft was like taking a nutritional pill rather than enjoying a meal. You sort of get the same effect, but the experience and its humanizing effects are completely lost. Morris and his circle transmitted their craft skills to younger generations. Uh, so on the left here, you have a painting by Frank Brangwyn, who was uh, initially an apprentice of Morris. He went on to become an artist and printmaker uh, in his own right. Um, and uh, of a young man in one of Morris's workshops. And then on the right, you have an image from uh, late 1920s, early 1930s of one of the uh, workers at Morris's factory in Merton Abbey weaving uh, a tapestry. Uh, May, uh, May Morris, who was Morris's younger daughter, so I introduced Jenny Morris earlier. Uh, May Morris was the younger daughter, um, and she, as I said, went on to become an extremely skilled um, needleworker and uh, craftswoman in her own right. She designed embroidery uh, and also jewellery, uh, and she took over the embroidery um, aspects of Morris & Co. when she was very young, I think about 19. Um, and May, amongst other things, taught and lectured um, and demonstrated embroidery to kind of to share this skill with a number of other people. So you see here May on the left. Um, in the middle is her book uh, about decorative uh, needlework, um, and she designed the cover of this book as well. And on the right, you see her embroidering at her home in Hammersmith. There's also here uh, notes from Morris, one of Morris's um, embroidery lectures, um, and so she lectured um, at in London and also in Birmingham. Uh, she actually also lectured on other subjects um, all over the place, so in, including in America, she went on lecture tours. Uh, but this is an example of, of some of her notes, and these the lect lectures covered the practical skills of embroidery, so design, technique, materials, you know, how you do this yourself, essentially. So this brings us on uh, quickly to the end, uh, which is craft as an art form. Uh, so the idea that there should be no distinction between art and craft was something that Morris was really, really um, very strongly believed in. Um, and there's a constant blurring between what some people might consider art, so kind of, you know, stained glass, or maybe not even stained glass, but sculpture, fine art, um, drawing, painting, and then the, the applied art, so stained glass, um, textiles, um, wallpaper, etc. So there's always a blurring between that in Morris's understanding and in the work of his circle. So probably the best example of that is the work of Edward Byrne-Jones. Um, Byrne-Jones is known best as a painter, uh, and so the image that you see on the right, which actually belongs to the V&A, uh, is an example of one of his oil paintings. This is unfinished, um, but you can see there's a real um, aesthetic resemblance with the image on the left, which is actually a very early design for embroidery. Uh, in the middle, you have a design for stained glass that has then been basically touched up to make it into a more finished piece. So then there's something that is a design, so not, you know, traditionally speaking, a work of art that has then been transformed into something that, you know, has a lot more um, presence in itself uh, and is probably, I would say, acceptable as a standalone piece of art. I don't know what you think, but I would be very happy to have that on my wall as a, you know, as a, as a finished piece. So... Burn Jones really approached painting as a craft. You know, he really honed his technique. Um, he worked on painting not in the sort of very spontaneous way that we perhaps associate with sort of the artistic genius of the 20th century, but very much as a craft skill uh, with the medium being paint. So he was very painstaking. He really uh, practiced things over and over and over again. He made huge numbers of sketches. You know, he really kind of crafted his work in a way that, you know, it's, it's not the Jackson Pollock approach to creating a painting at all. 
So I'd be interested to know, I'm not personally a maker, um, and I'm sure a lot of you are either people who consider yourselves craftspeople or artists, and I would be interested to know whether you think there is a difference, you know, uh, are you happy to use those terms interchangeably? If you're a person who makes objects, are you, do you want to be known as an artist? Are you quite proud not to be known as an artist and, you know, reclaim the idea of craftspersonship? Um, you know, I think that's something that is debatable, but Morris working within the hierarchy of art being better than craft was very keen that the craft skills should be elevated to the work, to works of art. Uh, and so you see here just examples um, of uh, some tech, well, a design for a textile and then a textile itself, which, you know, show the artistry, I think, of the work produced up by Morris and co. And Morris recognised in modern society there was very little space for artistic creativity and freedom. And he wrote in 1889, I must turn from the great body of men who are producing utilities and who are debarred from applying art to them to a much smaller group, indeed a very small one. I must turn to a group of men who are not working under masters, who employ them to produce for the world market, but who are free to do as they please with their work and are working for a market which they can see and understand. Whatever the limitations may be to work under, they work. That is the artists. So for Morris, artistry is not different from craftsmanship. It's that artistry has intellectual freedom uh, and also you know, the desire to, the joy of creating essentially. That's really what differentiates it. It's not a question of medium or even of aesthetics. It's to do with the, the conditions of working. And I think it's Morris's artistry and his understanding of this that has um, led to the enduring popularity for about 150 years of his, of his work. Um, so we have an example here of a woodblock um, and a, a textile design. You know, this was it's extremely popular textile design that is you know, still used a lot today. And I think it's also his belief in the humanizing qualities of craftsmanship as an art form that makes his message about the importance of craft still relevant today. Craft for us is a means of seeking solace and for challenging things about the world that we do not like and do not wish to participate in. As Morris wrote, we should welcome even the feeble protest which is now being made against the vulgarization of all life. The revival of handicraft is contemptible on the surface in face of gigantic fabric of commercialism, yet taken in conjunction with the general movement towards freedom of life for all, it is both noteworthy and encouraging. So my understanding is that for Morris, craft was at the core of what is meant to be a person existing in the world. To misquote Tennyson's, I am a part of all that I have met, it is perhaps for Morris a case of, I am part of all that I have made. And to finish, just one example of how Morris's passion for crafts continues to inspire in ways he may never have foreseen. So this, some of you may know, is the William Morris Gallery where I work. Um, and uh, I hope some of you have been, I hope that some of you might have the opportunity to go um, in due course. Uh, so this is the building. I mentioned Morris did come from a wealthy background. So this is, you know, this is where he lived as a teenager. So certainly not, um, you know, a craftsperson uh, uh, type house. Um, but something that we did recently for London Craft Week um, was a tattooing demonstration. So this idea that craft can be applied and artistry can be applied to any media is something that we take very seriously. And so London Craft Week uh, happened in October this year. And so our craft uh, was tattooing. So we invited a tattoo artist and he came and worked with us in the stores for a long time with me and looking at the archives, gaining inspiration from Morris's work. Uh, and then he demonstrated the entire craft skill of tattooing. So the artist Daniel is quite unusual in that he draws freehand on the subject. He doesn't uh, draw on paper and then transfer like a lot of people do. You know, he, it, this is a spontaneous um, new way of creating. Um, and so he, yeah, he draws, draws freehand and then he tattoos over. So in the top right, you can see him drawing. Uh, lower right, you can see him actually tattooing. Uh, and on the left, you can see the finished piece, which is inspired by Mara work so I wasn't able to show you the video um, my internet connection's not good enough um, but I'm hoping that we might be able to share that in the chat because we made just a couple of minute video just so you get the full um, understanding of, of that process so I'm going to stop sharing my screen now um, hope you're still with me thank you very much for listening everybody um, we do have a few questions that have come in, but I do encourage anybody with any other ones to just pop them in the Q&A function uh, now. And just to say that um, we've just posted the link to that video for the tattooing demonstration in the chat. So if you were interested in seeing it, you can find the link in there.
Um, I think the first question is, uh, was Morris interested in the contemporary artistic work of working people, such mm -hmm. as rag runs and painted wares used on barges? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, so Morris was very interested in you know, what we might consider kind of folk, folk art, I suppose. Um, he generally seemed to focus not so much on um, the British context, actually, as on international examples. So I also note there's someone here who's just asked a question about England-centric, and mm. Morris, I think, was of the opinion that the socio-political system in England had led to basically the destruction of craft generally, so that there wasn't that much good to choose from, essentially. Um, that's not true in all cases at all. So, for example, I don't know if you know the the Sussex Chair, which is a famous kind of, it's probably the most famous piece of work by Morris and Co. It was designed by Philip Webb. Um, and the Sussex Chair was based on sort of vernacular English examples. And also actually Webb's architecture was based on vernacular English examples. So he was, they, they as a group, they were interested in British craft, but I think it was generally more historical. Um, I think they were kind of so dismayed about what they saw as the, yeah, the degradation of, of British craft that they didn't really focus on it too much. Uh, however, Morris, uh, for example, travelled to Iceland on a couple of occasions. He was really enamoured with Iceland because he felt it was kind of the purest form of a historical society that you could get in Europe, essentially. Um, and he brought back examples of folk craft from Iceland. So we have in the gallery, you know, a woman's waistcoat, a kind of very traditional sort of like bodice waistcoat thing, uh, belts, drinking horns and spoons, those sorts of things. So he was definitely interested in uh, contemporary craft as well, but he, I would say his, his approach mainly was historic uh, and that extends also to international examples so he was fascinated by you know for want of a better word Persian carpets um you know, sort of you know carpets from the Middle East uh Indian textiles you know all kinds of different things uh, and so some of them would have been contemporary. Hmm. Um, there's another question around uh resources and guides to arts and crafts based in Scotland specifically and if there's any kind of estates or museums or archives mm -hmm. or anything that you could recommend um, other than those relating to the GSA or spook school movement is what's mm. been there. Um, actually, I have to say, with regards to Scotland, your guess is probably as good as mine. I'm sure lots of people here would know a lot, lot better than myself. Um, I know, obviously, in terms of sort of slightly later uh, arts and crafts movement, then Glasgow, of course, was the centre of, of all that production. Uh, and so, you know, the museums in Glasgow have, you know, amazing collections relating to, um, you know, to Macintosh and, you know, so the slightly later arts and crafts movements associated with that. Um, I'm afraid I don't know specifically about other resources in Scotland, probably the lesser known ones, but I can certainly look into that. And I, I'm sure there might be other people watching, actually, who have a lot better idea than I am in this case. Yeah. I mean, I would just recommend that Historic Environment Scotland have got some really interesting things around um, arts and crafts specifically in Scotland, and then also places like Hill House. Um, you know, there are quite a few things to go and find out there. There definitely are resources. Um, the next question is in regard to May Morris and the women of the arts and crafts movement. How do you think the idea of craftsperson or craftsmanship subverts the idea of domestic craft and embraces mm. women's liberation? Yeah, I mean, I think, so I, you know, Morris used the word craftsmanship, which, you know, I try and avoid when I'm writing, you know, I've been quoting him saying that, but I do try and just use the word craft or, you know, craftspersonship sounds a bit strange, but, you know, the word craft. Um, I think there are varieties because in a lot of respects, you know, work done in the home by women is, you know, considered as maybe craft or not kind of proper work. And then as soon as it is professionalized, it becomes, you know, men's work. And I'm thinking of a great example of that is cooking. You know, so you have, you know, majority of cooking traditionally done in the home by women, majority of professional chefs, men. You know, so that idea that, you know, once you take something out of the domestic sphere, it becomes more serious. Um, and that, you know, is obviously um, grossly unfair. However, when you think about the the creative license that Morris believes um, that was intrinsic in craft and actually the empowerment that comes through craft I think it can be seen as a very valuable way of, sort of subverting the normal hierarchy of labor uh, you know so I'm thinking of you know Rizika Parker's work the subversive stitch about the you know the way that embroidery has traditionally been a way for women to um, to show their ideas express their creativity um, and actually subvert the status quo you know in a very kind of uh, you know, inoffensive way that people don't really notice. Um, and so, you know, there were certainly many women 
uh, within the arts and crafts movement. I've tried to show you some examples of their work because I think it's quite easy just to kind of always focus on Morris and then, you know, actually not realize that, you know, people like Kate and Lucy Faulkner were working, um, you know, alongside him from the very beginning. Um, Jane, Jane's sister, and of course their daughters were, you know, were very skilled craftspeople in their own right. Um, so I do think there is a, gender neutral aspect even though Morris talks about craftsmanship that I think is just semantics and I think there is a gender neutral understanding in his idea that craft actually is a liberating factor for everybody uh, and certainly in news from nowhere you know that well for example Mistress Philippa the stonemason you know that is quite a good way of showing that craft skills are not something that um, are, are gender biased really. Mm. Um, the next question comes from uh, comes about Ikea. Hmm. Would, uh, would you imagine that Morris would have admired the impact of Ikea providing better design to the masses? Mm. This is really, really complicated. I, it's a great question because I, I, we created an exhibition about the Bauhaus uh, a couple of years ago at the gallery and about craft skills and, you know, about the role of craft versus mass production in the 20th century. And I think Morris would have liked the principle of IKEA in the idea that good design should be available, you know, cheaply and um, efficiently to all. However, I suppose the issue is that the problems that Morris saw on a national level, we now perceive on an international level. So Morris was worried about, you know, the workers in Britain who were working in factories making, you know, textiles for people to, to, so everyone could have, you know, nice prints in their home. Um, and while, you know, now we have a situation where something like IKEA has led to most people in Europe being able to have, you know, nice tables in their home. It hasn't necessarily made the world uh, a more egalitarian place, I suppose, in the sense that, you know, there is always a cost, I think, to, you know, to uh, having products that are cheaply made. And so, you know, that's not a knock at IKEA at all, but that's just, you know, that's just the way of it. And I don't think the, you know, international socio political situation is something that Morris would have you know aspired to so I think that um, while the idea of democratizing design of course is is extremely important um, the way that it is done I think he would have it can't can't be done only with the idea of profit in mind um, and I suppose our system does not allow for a good idea to then flourish without kind of um the capitalist um framework that morris was so broadly against yeah i think arguably we're still working within those structures yeah i, I would agree mm. um with regards to block printing of wallpaper mm -hmm. do you think that morris was influenced by techniques he studied from other countries e.g mm -hmm. india yes so morris was fascinated by india so morris didn't travel to india um but he knew about Indian textiles in part because Thomas Wardle, who was the uh, master dyer who he worked with in Leek, um, also imported Indian textiles. And there were lots of other connections, obviously, you know, with India um, at that time. So he definitely was in influenced by the colours, the patterns. Um, there is a sort of little series of textile designs that are very, very Indian sort of in appearance. Um, so no, absolutely, um, he was he was definitely influenced um, by Indian printed cottons, yeah, for sure. And then I think for our final question, because we're just about to run out of time. Um, oh, there's another one. <laughs> All Morris's textiles design are of summer foliage, foliage, nothing from the winter. Why do you think that was? Is it part of his sunny, optimistic Christmas? <laughs> uh, yeah, there's no Christmas designs, so that would be that would be very commercial. Um, it's a very good question. I presume it's because um, he maybe enjoyed spending time outside in his gardens during the summer, I suppose, the English summer. Um, I also actually, I don't know in any way near enough about botany to know about the differences between summer and winter foliage, um, you know, in the 1860s, 70s, and now, you know, whether there were there was more just sort of distinct seasonal things. Um, I'm trying to think whether there's any evergreens. I don't know whether acanthus is a kind of an evergreen type plant. I honestly don't know. Um, but that's, it's a really good question. But no, you're, you're quite right. There's nothing kind of, and the, and the colors are also are not really sort of autumnal or, or wintry uh, in the way that other, um, you know, I'm thinking of the Century Guild, for example, which was another design collective slightly after Morris, but they have a lot of kind of lovely autumnal colors. And yeah, that's not really in Morris's palette. So um, yeah, very good question. Yeah. Just, it deserves more study. Mm. 
Um, I would just say uh, to come to an end there, uh, we actually have, you quoted Richard Sennett in the talk. We actually have a talk with Richard Sennett next week. Amazing. Oh, well, he'll be much better than me. That's great. <laughs> uh, so if anyone would like to come along for that, you can um, get tickets for that on the website now. I think it's on Thursday next week. Um, and yeah, you can find out obviously more about Assemble's residency with v and Dundee on the website. And then William Morris Gallery have loads of wonderful resources on their website. Um, and we've posted that link to the um, tattooing video. And I think that probably brings us to an end. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for such a brilliant talk. It was lovely to have you.